Thanks so much for the opportunity. Okay, so um, I was tasked to talk about uh, the, the new balloons that are out there. There's three that are approved. Uh, first uh, that was approved was actually the reshape, and it's a dual balloon, 450 ml in each balloon. They're saline-filled balloons. You need an endoscopy to place it and remove it. Uh, and um, the placement and the removal for all these balloons can be done under conscious sedation, but depending on your anesthesia comfort, uh, and the, the patient and their, their anatomy, you may have to do this under general. Orbera is a single balloon. It was prior, uh, previously known as the BIB, the bioenteric uh, intergastric balloon. And it has been um, the balloon that's been placed uh, worldwide uh, most frequently um, because it's been around for a long time. Uh, FDA approved that one probably in September of 2015. And this is uh, uh, the last one to be approved is the Obalon. This is a swallowable balloon. You need fluoroscopy to place it. And you can place up to three serial balloons. This is a uh, balloon that is inflated. Let me see if the next slide shows it. I'll go back for a sec. Um, it has a nitrogen mixture that's in it. It's, a, it's basically not saline filled, so it rises up into the fundus, which makes a big difference in terms of patient symptoms and, um, and comfort. And with the Obalon, you also, you don't need an endoscopy to place it. You do need a spot fluoro or any, some way to confirm that uh, the capsule, which is radiographically identifiable, is in the stomach and not in the esophagus before you inflate it. There are absolute contraindications. Prior gastric surgery is definitely one of them. Uh, in the uh, Italian series, there were uh, patients that had had a lap band placed and was removed, and that was like 10 years ago, so they decided to put a balloon in these patients. And in those series, they had about two perforations out of thousands of patients, but the perforations were always in the patients who had prior uh, band surgery. There's other um, data in the literature talking about patients who had had a Nissen who had the balloon placed, and they had a perforation in that. So because of that, uh, through the FDA approval process, any prior gastric surgery is an absolute contraindication. There's also, um, sadly, in our literature, a couple of um, a couple of papers or, or case studies about uh, why you don't want to put a balloon in a sleeve because it's prior gastric surgery and you don't want to do that. Uh, for the intragastric balloon, people have said hiatal hernia greater than or equal to five centimeters is an absolute contraindication, and I would say probably anything more than three centimeters is going to uh, cause a problem for the patient. And obviously the other litany, the coagulation disorders, potential bleeding lesion, um, patients are maintained on a PPI with the balloon in place, so that is uh, important because of the incidence of ulcers or erosions or other issues. Um, I had a patient I was about to take the balloon out of. I had an Orbera placed. She called me the day before removal saying she was really short of breath. She couldn't walk far. She had just flown uh, from west coast to east coast and got it started on a birth control pill. Massive saddle embolus. Cardiologist saved her life. She still had a balloon in and she was on Eliquis. I doubled up on the PPI and I pulled it out when she came off um, her, her anticoagulation. And she had no ulcer, uh, very minor irritation of the stomach. Relative contraindications, previous abdominal surgery. I've placed the Orbera. I'm interested in placing the Obalon just so um, everyone's clear. And I feel that um, prior abdominal surgery is just really up anything on the stomach, in which case it would be an absolute contraindication. So it's, these are relative depending if you feel like someone had a splenectomy and this might be a problem for their, you know, their stomach, that might be something to consider. And um, uh, esophagi a strong history of GERD or esophagitis, you may not want to put the balloon in. And if they're on chronic uh, non steroidals and obviously if they have an uncontrolled psychiatric disorder, I would call that an absolute contraindication. But uh, this is put up. So what are the expectations for these balloons? With all of them, you know, you can say you're gonna get 20 to 40 pounds of weight loss. The studies show that you can get up to 33% excess weight loss. That's an Italian study from Dr. Jenko. Jaime Ponce uh, put in for the reshape, and this was their pivotal trial, and showed 25% excess weight loss in the patients that uh, were treated from the beginning with the balloon. And um, their trial was a, a, a crossover, so the patients 
if they were on the diet or medica uh, the medical part of it, if they lost too much weight on the medical part, they couldn't get the balloon. So there was a little bit with the crossover, which is why the patients who got the balloon first did better than the patients who, who didn't. And with the Obalon, the initial study only showed about 10% uh, weight loss, uh, but that study, the, the patients that are currently doing ob getting Obalon off study seem to be doing uh, much better. And in all of these, uh, because your bear is a single balloon, there have been minor erosions. Uh, that's what I've seen when I've removed them as well. The reshape, there are rare ulcers, the double balloon. The, the shape of it had been changed midway through their FDA study. And then with the Obalon, they've seen some minor erosions as well. Orbera, you know, um, this is a legitimate 4.2% early removal. The idea is to keep these balloons in for six months. I've had a patient with gastric uh, obstruction, and um, it, basically the balloon settled into the antrum, and the rest of the stomach got super big. It's a great x-ray. I didn't put it here, um, but I, you know, had to place an NG tube and then took the patient the next day for early uh, balloon removal. This occurred about four and a half months out. And these are some of the other things that people have seen. I've taken a balloon out for uh, persistent abdominal pain and discomfort. Uh, I've not had a balloon deflate. The instance of that is under 1%, but it can happen. And um, the instance of then having to go and get the balloon out laparoscopically, surgically, is uh, under 1% as well. And reshape has very similar adverse effects. The Obalon, interestingly, is much better tolerated by the patient. The difference is because it has uh, got the nitrogen mixture and it's not saline. Once you put these balloons in, people feel like a heaviness in their abdomen. They could tell you that they feel it. And uh, with, the, with the air filled, their symptomatology is much less. Um, Salman's going to talk about you know, how to manage these patients, so I did not, I'm not getting into it. But definitely the Obalon is um, uh, having lower uh, uh, symptoms. FDA came out uh, with some caveats to this and warnings that uh, both the reshape and Orbera uh, can cause pancreatitis. The actual incidence of these patients having it was very low. However, FDA felt it was important to um, report it. And also, the balloons can get hyperinflated. Sometimes they hyperinflate with more fluid, and other times you can actually see a significant air fluid level so that there's some kind of air in there. And the presumption is, though, uh, some of our colleagues who've seen this and removed the balloon and, and cultured it haven't got any growth, that there's some bacterial overgrowth in the saline within the balloon. And with Obalon, it's really too soon to tell uh, because the numbers are just starting to roll in uh, as the sale force is rolling out the Obalon balloon. There are two other balloons in multicenter studies currently in the US. The ellipse is just getting started. This is a balloon that um, is uh, uh, also filled with a proprietal gas, uh, but the interesting thing about it is that it has a valve that disintegrates by four months, and then the patient passes the balloon. You swallow the balloon. There's no endoscopy involved, and uh, basically it's in for four months, and, it's, and, and then, you, uh, then patients pass it. And so far in the studies that they did, uh, the patients have all passed it and not had any obstruction. The spats. It's a SPATS-3 adjustable intergastric balloon. This is um, small data, but this study is currently already, I, re I think, reached full enrollment in the US in multicenter study. The one publication that I was able to really pull out, uh, 18 patients, BMI 37, they lost up to 38.5% of, uh, oh, actually, one year it was 48% excess weight loss. Um, 16 total adjustments for the patients. Some of the balloons uh, volume were adjusted for intolerance and symptomatology, and the rest were for uh, weight loss plateau. So it's nice that to, you can have an adjustable balloon, um, but again, the study, we'll see what the multicenter study shows. I'm going to talk about this because none of the other uh, speakers are going to, I think, mention this. Um, this was, uh, the, there's a circulating endoscopic stapler. This was brought up early data in SAGES 2013, so I'm just letting you know this. There's um, Terrace, I believe, is the name of another company that had uh, a stapler, an articulating endoscopic stapler. Um, but that product has been taken off because of some of the issues that they had. But they're looking to pursue the stapling, and I've been hearing trickles that they're pursuing the stapling device endoscopic, but I haven't seen um, any, any further stuff, but I just wanted to let you know that this was still 
as part of what's on the potential horizon. And you know, uh, when they did it, they placed up to um, 10 plications around, but again, the patients had some sym symptomatology, but at six months with the endoscopic stapling, they did achieve a 30% excess weight loss. Um, Dr. Revis is gonna be talking a little bit about the endoscopic anastomosis, but I'm beating him to this talk. Uh, so I, I, I did warn him that I had some cool slides that I wanted to share with you. These are uh, self-forming magnets that are released by the endoscope. This particular one is uh, with, um, uh, uh, this is not, this is, uh, this particular one, yeah, you're putting one with an endoscope, one with a col colonoscope. There are two companies out there that are doing that, GI Windows and Magnemosis. And you can see that by uh, day, day one, day four, you're seeing an opening, and day 12, it's pretty well healed. Uh, this is that they saw by 12 months, 37% excess weight loss. This was without any uh, stomach reduction. It's good to have friends in the business. So this is Chris Thompson's data uh, and given to me courtesy of uh, Reem Sharaya. Um, and this is some of the data that's out there. It also is very good in diabetics, and you can see a significant reduction in fasting glucose. But this is really the cool slide. Look at what's happening to the body. I mean, this bioimpedance testing, that's really telling uh, and exciting. So this is definitely something to watch. Uh, you know, we're creating a fistula, right? It, it's interesting, uh, but we're also creating it. Technically, it's a fistula, but it's also an anastomosis, and we, we planned on it. But you can see what the metabolic effects are. And this is a slide that I got from uh, Dr. Galvao Neto. I, uh, all right, I'm just going to tell you, I turned 50. I'm going to be 51 soon. So I was looking at this. I had to get a colonoscopy and, and an endoscopy. And at the same time, I had to give a talk uh, on, on uh, endoscopic treatments. And so this came up. I tried to convince Reem to do my endoscopy and give me Botox in my stomach. But it's, a, it's actually very interesting. You can see up to 11 kilos of weight loss. Um, so this is a, there's a couple of things. They were injecting Botox throughout the stomach. And it turns out uh, not so good in the antrum, way better if you put it in the fundus or the body, which is in keeping with what we see. You know, from our physiology, the fundus is what's giving us receptive relaxation. When you sort of paralyze it, it's not able to do that. You're gonna eat less, which is why uh, some of the other things that people are gonna talk about talks about reduction of the greater curve and taking away that receptive relaxation. And some non-endoscopic things that you should be aware of. There's a trial, uh, a study, multicenter study going on um, in the US looking at this left gastric artery embolization where there are coils placed in the left gastric artery. Very few publications, not a lot of data, so there's an ongoing recruitment. Obviously, all of us as surgeons were kind of concerned about causing ischemia and making collaterals to the stomach, uh, especially if you subsequently have to go back and do, let's say, a sleeve or a lesser um, lesser curve-based pouch for a gastric bypass, um, but there are surgeons involved in this study in addition to the interventional radiologists. And then lastly, you should know about deep brain stimulation. Uh, this is a nucleus accumbens, and um, there's a pacemaker that's placed with bilateral stimulation. It's a very small series, but it's shown some benefit, obviously, in your surgical procedure. You're going to hear about fractal and endoscopic sleeve gastro gastroplasty from uh, Dr. Zundel and also uh, uh, Dr. Sandlin's back there. He's going to talk about fractal. But I think the future might be a combo of these things. Uh, and maybe if you, and, and someone else is talking about liners, so you're going to get that. But it might be doing Botox in the fundus and then putting a duodeno jejunal liner in. So these all might be options for combo therapy that will give us better excess weight loss than, um, than currently what we're seeing with just a single uh, intervention like a balloon. So I think the future, uh, it's, it's really bright for obesity treatment. And I, I, would, I would posit that we are not really trying to treat the same patients that we treat surgically. We're trying to treat patients that are BMI 30 to 40, and that is actually a different uh, group of patients. And um, we're looking for excess weight loss to prevent issues. We're looking for excess weight loss to improve their comorbidities, which may just be joint pain. It may be getting them ready for an operation for their knee replacement. Um, but definitely, you need a multidisciplinary team. You have to look at your data. Um, and then I think 
that we're treating a complex problem and ultimately, like I said, it's gonna be combo therapies maybe for endoscopic stuff with fractal or ESG or something, but also um, something that no, nobody's talking about in this session, but adding medications to these endoscopic ventures really will uh, produce a more substantial weight loss. Thank you.